Okay, my, my name is Amy Goymore and I'm one of the lecturers in the law faculty and one of the subjects I teach is land law and in particular adverse possession, the law relating to squatters. Now in these three videos we're going to explore some further issues relating to squatters rights. Now you have been asked to consider whether there are any arguments for and against the law of adverse possession, the idea that a squatter, somebody on somebody else's land without permission, is able to become the owner of it after they've been on the land for a certain amount of time. Now let's begin by thinking about the arguments against the law of adverse possession and I want to go back to some of the reading you will have looked at earlier in this topic. You read about Harry Hallows who um, acquired a little bit of Hampstead Heath. You read about Mr Blackburn who acquired a local authority home in South London. What was your gut reaction to learning that those squatters had acquired those prime spots within London for nothing, merely by living on the land for a certain amount of time? Now to the naked eye it looks as though adverse possession is actually allowing people to steal another person's property. So this could be one of the arguments against the law of adverse possession, the idea that it, it goes against the grain to allow people to become property owners without necessarily paying for it. Let's look at the other side of the coin. Are there any justifications for the law of adverse possession? Well, I'm going to consider five possible rationales for the law. Now, the first rationale is quite technical, but it's important. The law of adverse possession can actually help us as a society work out who actually owns a particular plot of land. Now, to understand why, we need to go on a bit of a, a, bit of a diversion. Let's imagine that you want to buy a house, and let's imagine you want to buy a house from somebody called David. So, he's offering to sell you the house before you buy. You want to be certain that David owns that particular plot. Now, one way of being certain that he owns that plot is that sometimes ownership of land is recorded in a public land register, the land register. But let's imagine that David's plot is not recorded in the public land register. How can you be sure that he's the owner? Well, he might come back to you and say, well, I bought it from another person. Let's call that person Catherine. So how can you then be sure that Catherine was the owner when she sold it to David? Well, you can only be sure that Catherine was the owner if she bought from the owner. And you have to go back and back and back in order to be sure that the person you're buying from is actually the owner of the land. Now, it's really important that we know who owns land because buying and selling land depends on people having confidence that they're buying from the proper owner. It's important for the economy that people know that they are buying from the proper owner. So where does, that, where does the law of adverse possession come into all of this? Well, if you know that somebody has been adversely possessing land for a sufficiently long period of time, the law says that they are the owner of that piece of land. And suddenly we have the answer to the question, who owns a particular plot of land? So that purchasers can be confident in buying it. So where there's an evidential uncertainty as to who owns land, adverse possession can be very, very important in providing the answer. So that's the first reason why we might have a law of adverse possession. Another reason is based on the idea that in order for a legal system to function, it needs to be in touch with reality. Now let's imagine that I'm the legal owner of a plot of land, but somebody else has been living on it as if they are the owner for the last 20 years. Here, the law says one thing, that I'm the owner, but in fact, everybody else is going to think that the person living there is the owner. The law is out of touch with reality. And arguably, there is, a, there, there, there is an important concern in making the law match up with reality. And adverse possession can do that by saying that if you're living on land for a long period of time, you can become the owner. Okay, the third rationale for adverse possession is based on the idea that arguably we should be giving rights to those who use land rather than those who sit on their rights to land. Now, this is important because in England, land is a finite natural resource. We need to make good use of it. Now, to give you some statistics, around 3% of homes in England are currently empty, and that's over 600,000. Arguably, these homes should be being put to good use. Now, if people are aware of the law of adverse possession, 
they will realise that if they don't use their land and somebody else does, they will lose their rights. So this rationale is based on a use it or lose it theory. Now, the fourth possible rationale for adverse possession is based on a labour desert theory. Now, this is a theory um, created by the philosopher John Locke, who argued that those who work with and engage with property should be entitled to it. So if you work and live on property, you deserve some entitlement to the land. The final possible rationale for adverse possession is more psychological. And this is based on the idea that if you live on land, make it your home, you build up a psychological connection with that property. And arguably, the law has some function in respecting the psychological connection you have made with that land. And I, I'm sure that you've got some possessions that you've had for a long time that you've built up some kind of psychological or emotional attachment to it. And this rationale could explain part of the law of adverse possession. So the big question for all of us as land lawyers is whether these five rationales for the law of adverse possession together add up to a compelling case which actually justifies giving squatters ownership rights over somebody else's land.